from Philharmonic Hall in Lincoln Center, home of the world's greatest musical events, the Shell Oil Company brings you the New York Philharmonic Young People's Concerts under the musical direction of Leonard Bernstein. And here is Mr. Bernstein. Uh, since our last program, which was a very joyful occasion, if you recall, with all those talented young performers, since then, a sad thing has happened the sudden death of one of the greatest composers in the world, Paul Hindemith, and what beautiful music he wrote. Hindemith was a true master in the great German tradition, a worthy successor to the long line of great German composers that included Bach, Beethoven, Brahms, and Wagner. And in the minds of many people, he was the last of that long traditional line. Of course, people didn't always think of him that way. When Hindemith's music was first being heard in this country, there were outraged cries of ugly, shocking, dissonant, Bolshevik, unmelodic, heavy, brutal, bitter, atonal, especially atonal. That word was very loosely used in the old days to mean almost anything uncomplimentary about modern music. But Hindemith was never atonal. All his music depends in one way or another on a sense of key, or what is called tonality. Now, before we do anything else today, let's try to clear up once and for all what that word atonal means. It's really not so hard. It simply means using all the 12 different notes of the chromatic scale in such a way that no one note ever seems more important than another. In other words, in atonal music, no idea of a key or a home base is ever established as it is in the regular diatonic seven note scale. There you are, you know where you are. But in atonal music, you don't quite know where you are tonally. Composers who write in that non-tonal way, following the system invented by Arnold Schoenberg, usually base their pieces on what's called a tone row. That is, they put all those 12 notes in a, into a certain order of their own decision, like a scrambled scale, something like this. And then they develop the whole piece out of that 12-tone row. Now, all this is to tell you what Hindemith did not do. He was the last great German composer to resist the temptations of Schoenberg's 12-tone method, even at the risk of being called old-fashioned. But 30 years ago, when we were just beginning to know his music, he seemed anything but old-fashioned. I remember very well my first discovery of Hindemith, uh, which was a composition by him called Three Exercise Pieces. And I was fascinated by what seemed to me their daring and dissonance and defiance. They were fiendish. The first one starts like this, if I remember. Well, I immediately decided that Hindemith was a revolutionary, a Bolshevik. But I got a big kick out of the music because like any other young man, I was attracted to anything that seemed defiant and shocking. But as I grew older, I began to discover that that same etude piece I had thought so shocking wasn't basically much different in its nature from, let's say, a Bach two-part invention.
That is, it's a piece written to develop strong fingers and provide some interesting music at the same time so the pianist doesn't get bored with practicing. Just look, here's a bit from a Bach two-part invention. Now, here's a bit of that Hindemith one. What's the real difference? It's only one of language. The intention is the same, not to shock, but to instruct. It's not Bolshevik, it's traditional. Only Hindemith's notes are much more advanced, as they naturally would be, being written 200 years later. And once we hear it this way, as a continuation of what Bach started, Hindemith's music suddenly begins to sound much more normal. There's nothing shocking about it, you see? So what? Uh, see, I was beginning to find out that Hindemith really did belong with all the great German masters that had preceded him. Take his second piano sonata, for instance. In spite of its peculiar notes, its modern notes, let's say, it's really only a new kind of old sonata by Haydn. It starts like this. It's not so bad, but at first hearing, it may sound odd to you. But if you listen again carefully, you notice that the left hand is doing just what Mozart and Haydn always used to do, what's called an Alberti bass. Nothing hard about that. And the right hand is playing a lovely, simple tune. So what makes it so peculiar and modern? What are those modern notes? They're simply notes that make new combinations, that enlarge and enrich our musical language. I could easily rewrite that bit of music using the old kind of notes, and it would come out like a plain old-fashioned German tune. So you see, it's only Haydn in a new suit. And those modern notes are only what are called, now this is a hard word, cross-relations. But it's not as hard as it sounds. Let me show you what a cross-relation is. This sonata is in the key of G. So in the old-fashioned way, you'd expect the tune to be made out of the notes of the G major scale, which in fact it is. But now the sixth note of that scale, for instance, is E natural, that note. And that does occur in the melody. But in the preceding bar, in the accompaniment, we have just heard E flat. So that the conflict of these two notes, E natural and E flat, coming so close together, side by side, are called a cross relation. It's simple. And all it does is to make the language of music richer like adding new words to the vocabulary, but the music is still basically good old German lyricism, not at all shocking or ugly or anything. In fact, it's very pretty, only with a new, fresh kind of prettiness. Let's listen to it again. I don't know what people were talking about in those old days when they spoke about Hindemith's music being ugly. I remember a lot of heated arguments when we first heard his third string quartet, for instance, which people called viciously dissonant, wild and unpretty. And yet this quartet contains one of the prettiest, most tender movements in all 20th century chamber music. It begins like this.
that heavenly? The only thing that makes that music at all modern is the 20th century idea of bitonality. That's a word we've talked about often, if you remember. It means music written in two different keys at once. And in this case, the accompaniment starts very simply in A major, as you heard. And then the melody comes in in a whole other key, in C major. And together, they sound like this. It's a new modern sound, but you sure can't say it's unpretty or dissonant or Bolshevik. It's hard to believe these days that those words were ever used about Hindemith's music. And another word that was fashionable to use about certain pieces of Hindemith was the word bitter. The music was said to reflect the bitterness of the period after the First World War. And in fact, as recently as the day after Hindemith died, it's only a month or so ago, one music critic in his obituary of Hindemith mentioned this bitterness, and to prove it, he picked exactly wrongly one of the most cheerful and heartwarming pieces that Hindemith ever wrote, the Kleine Kammermusik, or little chamber music for five wind instruments. I'd like you to hear the first movement of this. It's a tiny movement, but I'd like you to hear it and see if you think it's bitter. that bitter music? It's the exact opposite. Gay, light, full of fun. And that was one of Hindemith's main qualities, the joy he put into music. He was a fun-loving man for whom music was everything in life. It was my idea of the, the total musician. He played music, wrote it, taught it, breathed it. He played jazz in cafes. He was concertmaster of an orchestra. He played the viola in a string quartet. 
He wrote books about music, but mainly he wrote music, every kind of music, big and little, serious, light, noble and jazzy, hard and easy, music for professionals, for amateurs and for children. He was a modern composer, but he was certainly never what we call an angry young man. He had too much love in him for that. He loved all the German music he had been born into, Bach, Mozart, Bruckner, and he just continued the line, making his own additions and changes. And the changes he made caused him to develop a style all his own. There's a certain Hindemith sound that you can't miss or ever mistake for anybody else's. And when a musician says that somebody's music sounds Hindemithian, we know exactly what he means. It immediately makes us hear a certain kind of sound in our minds. Now we're going to spend the rest of this program playing Hindemith's most famous masterpiece, his beautiful symphony, Matis der Mahler, which is the model of all Hindemithian sound, which has in it all the things we've talked about, tenderness, joy, vigor, and cross-relations, and bitonality, and much more. I think after we play this symphony, you'll understand what I mean when I say he was a great German composer. A Matis der Mahler in English means Matis the painter, and this title refers to the painter Matis Grünwald, a very famous German painter who lived and worked way back in the early 16th century. Now, Hindemith wrote a long, dramatic opera about him, an opera, not a symphony. And one of the reasons that Hindemith was so attracted to this subject was the struggle Hindemith himself was having with the Nazi government of Germany. You see, Mat Matis Grünwald had also had such a struggle 400 years earlier when he found himself caught up in the religious wars between the Protestant peasants and the Catholic nobles. And he was torn between two loyalties. He was also torn between his sense of beauty as an artist and his sense of duty as a citizen. Now, which is more important at a time of war and crisis and bloodshed, to take part in the struggle, to give your life to the cause, or to stay home and paint your pictures? And this was exactly the problem that Hindemith himself was facing in the early 1930s. Should a composer just go on writing his wind quintets and string quartets and piano sonatas <coughs> while the Nazis are turning his country into an armed prison camp, or should he stand up and fight? Should he knuckle under and write the kind of music the government commands him to write? Or should he stick to his principles? Uh, you're all too young to remember, but in those days, the Nazis were burning books by the thousands, suppressing freedom on all sides, and locking up anyone who didn't agree with their insane theories. And here was Hindemith, a free, creative soul in a country where he couldn't be free. He didn't agree with the Nazi theories, and the Nazis certainly didn't agree with his music. So this opera about Matis the painter was his way of protesting, and in it he solved Grünwald's problem as well as his own by deciding that an artist is also a citizen and a fighter, only his way of fighting is by practicing his art by creating beauty in his own way, even if it means leaving his country forever, which Hindemith finally did in 1938. <coughs> now, what we're going to hear is certainly not that whole opera, but three orchestral sections that Hindemith took from it and put together to form three movements of a symphony. Each of these movements has a title, which is copied from the titles of three famous pictures that Matis Grünwald painted to adorn the altar of the church at Isenheim. The first picture and the first movement of the symphony is called Engel Concert or Angel Concert, Concert of Angels. You see how light and lovely it is. There is the, there are the virgin and child being serenaded by a band of angels, shining angels all in white and crimson and gold. I hope you can see that clearly. It's all radiant with sweetness and gladness, and, of course, so is the corresponding music by Hindemith. It's a charming, lively, and very tonal piece of music, again, in the key of G. In fact, the very first chord you hear in this angel concert 
is a pure G major triad. Nothing can be more tonal than that. Of course, right after that chord comes one of those cross relations we were talking about. That B flat crosses against the B natural, which is in the chord. That's the cross relation. But it doesn't disturb the tonality. It's in G. In fact, this first movement of Matus der Mahler is one of the clearest, most appealing pieces Hindemith ever wrote. It has a lovely, calm introduction, which quotes an old German melody, Es zungen drei Engel, Three Angels Were Singing. It goes like this. rather like Silent Night. And all that introduction is bathed in the soft glow of that G major chord. And then comes the main fast part of the movement with this famous theme. And all the other tunes in the movement are equally charming and jolly and rhythmic and dancey. The piece develops by juggling all these tunes around together in counterpoint, and it all ends in a dazzling burst of angelic light, like the Greenwald painting itself. Here now is the first movement of Hindemith Symphony, Mathis der Mahler.
Well, I don't think anyone would call that first movement of Matis der Mahler difficult or atonal or lacking in melody. It's all joy from beginning to end. But now we come to the second movement and the second picture. And this is all grief and sadness. It's a very short movement, only four minutes, but it packs an awful lot of emotion into that brief span. This movement is called Grablegung, or in English, the entombment, after the Greenwald painting that shows the body of Christ being laid in the tomb. You see how simple it is, how bare and stark. I don't know if you can see the faces of the women who are mourning, but they are heartbreaking in their sorrow. And the music catches this mood perfectly. It's also bare and stark, and is full of halting rhythms like the faltering footsteps of mourners. And it has sighing harmonies at the end. long, comforting melodies. I think everyone agrees that this little movement is the most beautiful thing Hindemith ever wrote. Here it is.
That's a glorious piece of music. And now comes the third picture, which is the most elaborate and complicated of the three. This is called The Temptation of St. Anthony, and it shows the saints being plagued by all kinds of demons and monsters that are torturing him. There's the saint, and there are these unbelievable-looking people, or animals, and to match this scary, grotesque atmosphere, Hindemith begins his last movement with the only music in the symphony that might conceivably be considered atonal. It seems like a powerful, free improvisation for the whole orchestra, and at the very beginning, it sounds almost like a 12-tone row that we were talking about before, almost, but not quite. It's like this. Now that's as close as Hindemith ever comes to writing atonal music, but it's exactly right in this place because it describes the feeling of tension and agony with amazing accuracy. Now, after this dramatic introduction, the main fast body of the movement follows, wildly fast and exciting, like a mad chase. But towards the end, when the notes are flying thick and fast in the strings, the wind instruments sing out a shining melody of salvation, the old chant, Lauda Sion Salvatorem, which goes like this. And then finally, the brass sings out an Alleluia, so brilliant and strong that you actually feel the salvation of St. Anthony, of Grunwald, of Hindemith, and eventually of Germany itself. So, in his inspired music, Hindemith is telling us not only of three pictures by Grunwald, but of greatness, of faith, and of hope for all men. If he had never written anything else but this symphony, we would owe him our gratitude forever. And now as we listen to this last movement of Matis der Mahler, let us be grateful that for 68 years, Paul Hindemith was part of our world. <laughs>